Hi folks, welcome back to the Curly Boy Theatre. This is our last talk of the block and the last one before the closing keynote today. And I'm very pleased to introduce our next three speakers who are going to be talking about how a major museum runs on Python. So we have Greg Turner, Ali Happerfield, and Simon Lofler. And uh, this talk will be pre-recorded, but our speakers, as you can see, are all here and we'll be taking questions at the end. So we will be able to have them back. And uh, just before we run the talk, uh, there's a quick warning that this talk has a discussion of COVID in the way it relates to the impact of COVID on museums and, and projects. Um, so just a thing to be aware of. And with that out of the way, I think we're ready to roll. Good afternoon, everyone. Today, Ali and I are speaking from the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, where ACME is situated, and Simon is speaking from the lands of the Guyana people. And together, we want to pay our respects to their elders, past and present, and we acknowledge the sorrow of the impact of colonisation on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. And we also recognise their innovation, resilience, strength and pride. If the last decade was the golden age of screen content, then this new decade is where we collectively need to find ways to make sense of it, to navigate through it, and become better people as a result of it. Maybe this new age is the golden age of attention and intention. ACME is Australia's national museum of film, TV, video games, digital culture and art, but we're also the museum of things that you already carry around in your pocket with a museum of something we're all experienced with and which many of you helped to create. So how can we show the magic behind something you already have in your pocket? How do we add to that magic with expanded experiences and horizons? And how can we help people become more aware of their own intention and attention when it comes to the moving image? How do we keep everything updated and running smoothly? And the answer, of course, to all those questions is that we use Python. In 2018, we won a $40 million state government bid to completely renew what we do and the way we engage our audiences. This renewal project encompasses a reinvented building in Federation Square, which contains heaps of new public space to congregate uh, distantly and to share ideas. This video shows concepts from our major new permanent exhibition that tells the story of the moving image, from shadows on a cave wall, through early cinema, special effects and world building, right up to events that are happening in the world today. I'm Greg, and I'm currently a freelance creative technology strategist and maker, but I was CTO for Agnes Renewal, and that means I built some technology, but more importantly, I built a team of people drawn from across Agni and from special recruits like Simon and Ali. And then I looked for ways for us to create new things and improve existing things and let old things go, all in response to audience needs, so that Agni could become this magical place we want it to be when we reopen. Museums face this weird challenge between having to conserve data basically forever for the public of tomorrow and having to con continuously invent and create for the public today. And that gives us many paradoxical questions to answer, such as how do we invent and create new technology for an exhibition that needs to last for 10 years? Uh, how can we plan for things like no accessible cabling but easy maintainability? How do we exhibit and tour art made with technology we've never encountered before? And how can we conserve that technology for the future? How can we provide security when we literally let the public in through our front door? And can someone stop these kids from climbing on our very expensive stuff? Okay, that last one may not be strictly a hardware question. I showed you a tweet from Simon Wardley just now. And in shaping our technology strategy at ACME, I considered Wardley's pioneers, settlers and town planners model of innovation. Um, now, these are uncomfortable terms in Australia, so 
Instead, I'm tipping my hat to Bruce Pascoe, who tells stories of Indigenous innovation and reminds us that this kind of thinking well predates colonial stories. So we're using much more of this idea of seed sowers, cultivators and agriculturalists. And Python, of course, helps us at all of these stages. In assembling the team, it was important to find people who could balance sowing the seeds of the new acne with its needs to reach stability, to cultivate and ultimately to turn a single experimental seed into a viable and robust crop of technology. And Ali and Simon are two of those people. And over the past three years, we've been lucky enough to build a bunch of stuff using Python, from experimental machine learning on our video collection, through to rock solid media players to climate sensors. And some of it failed and some of it succeeded. Um, some of it didn't go anywhere and some of it took us in directions we could never have predicted. And so Ali, Simon and I are here today to tell you about some of our most valuable experiences. Over to you, Simon. Working in museum tech is super fun. It's one of those rare jobs where you get to let your curiosity roam free. And as long as you keep museum visitors at the center of every experiment, you can play with whatever technology you like. The Acme Experience and Digital team is all about enabling ourselves to make new and better mistakes. Uh, learn from them, and then pick the best ones to make into museum experiences. We're also really keen to connect with you, the Python community. So as our software and hardware has been reaching feature completion, we've been open sourcing it so that you can come along for the ride, whether that be contributing to the code base or using any of our projects in your own gallery or museum experiences. At the center of our renewed gallery experience is the lens. This beautiful throwback to a Viewmaster image reel is a recyclable cardboard disc with an embedded NFC chip. Visitors take it around the renewed museum with them and tap on any objects that they'd love to collect and take home with them. Boop. After being added to the lens, the Acme post-visit website becomes the start of a new journey for these objects, providing origin stories, more information about the creators, and also many side quests that come from the constellations that these objects belong to. To collect objects in the gallery, visitors look out for the soft, warm, glowing heartbeats of our lens readers. We design these with repairability and modularity in mind, using as many off-the-shelf and future-proof parts as possible. The Acme lens reader consists of a Raspberry Pi 4 running a Python Bellina OS image, it's also got some Adafruit compatible RGB LEDs to provide the warm heartbeat and an IDE Tech Kiosk 4 NFC reader to read the lens when visitors tap on it. But why didn't we build a phone app? Well, we definitely considered it, but the advantage of the lens were pretty overwhelming. Uh, there's a low barrier to entry because all of the instructions that we need to give are tap on the glowing things. Uh, so this is really great for accessibility across age ranges. There's also no batteries needed, no downloads, no storage space. They're COVID friendly. You never have to actually make physical contact with anything. And most importantly, they encourage you to put your phone away and focus on the experiences and the people that you're having them with. That's not to say that phones won't be part of Acme's future, but right now the lens makes the most sense to us. To make our magical gallery experiences possible, we had to choose devices that were small enough, reliable enough, and easy enough to update, replace, and maintain on 350 plus devices over 10 plus years. The logical choices were a Raspberry Pi, a Dell Optiplex or similar, or a BrightSign. As you can see, although the Raspberry Pi is a bit cheaper, the risk involved with this relatively unproven technology is pretty big for Acme, even when you take into account the open source ecosystem and multitude of deployment opportunities that arise from it. So we started our experiments with BrightScience, attempting to love their proprietary JavaScript implementation, BrightScript, um, but we soon found that debugging was pretty difficult and their documentation was patchy, so even though we got them to technically work, we moved on. After the relative pain of developing with Bright Science, it was such a nice thing to return to Python and playing around with Raspberry Pis. But the big question was, 
Would we be able to get them to play 1080p video for eight hours a day smoothly and reliably? Uh, display museum labels, which are basically Flask apps running on the same Raspberry Pis. Uh, and also, could we get them to talk to the NFC hardware nicely so that they could respond to lens taps from the visitors? It was pretty pleasantly surprising when they handled all of those things reliably. Uh, I mean, we had some glitches. We had a few little stumbling blocks with window managers, chromium flags, and weird HDMI timings all running in a Docker container. But thanks to our lovely creative team of software developers, we managed to solve all of these problems and get them running really nicely. So with a demo desk full of functional devices, our fearless leader decided to place the order. And the next day, the Raspberry Pi 4 dropped. This ended up being a good thing to test our replaceability and future-proofing. Um, and although we had a few sleepless nights, we managed to move our images and our peripherals over to the new ARM processor relatively easily. One of the wonderful side effects of using small, expandable, single-board computers is that once we'd finished our feature set, we could keep experimenting with new ideas to solve problems we didn't envisage at the start of the project. One of which came up talking to the Acme registrations team. They were wanting to borrow a bunch more objects from film studios around the world, but they were price limited by all of the climate monitoring software and hardware that had to come along with it. Uh, luckily, we were taking a pretty proactive approach to monitoring our devices by putting temperature and humidity sensors in all of the cases to check that they weren't going to halt and catch fire at any point. So we could offer a similar solution to the registrations team. But seeing they didn't need all of the processing power of a Raspberry Pi 4, we could offer this climate sensing single Docker container running a Python Prometheus client all on a Raspberry Pi 0. The best thing is that because this was exactly the same container that was running across all of our multi-containers on other Raspberry Pis, we could use the same linting, testing, deployment, alerting, and monitoring software across the board. It was the best happy accident to come out of our demo desk. Now that we had a giant herd of cats, we needed a way of feeding them with a capable deployment strategy. Benjamin found Bolina Cloud which is a really nice way of deploying Docker multi-containers over the command line. So now it's as easy as pushing to those devices with git push Bolina main. Excellent. Once the Bolina OS image is burnt to a micro SD or USB stick, they handle all this operating system updates, which is awesome, because then we can just focus on our own software. They also have really great APIs. So the next piece of the puzzle to build was a system that could push device configurations to all of those devices through Bellina's API. To talk through this, I'll hand off to my fellow creative technologist, Ali. Thank you, Simon. You've heard a bit from Simon about the wonderful wild ecosystem of devices we've been building to allow our visitors to interact with our galleries using their lens. We also needed a system to keep track of all this. Each of those devices needs to know what media it's meant to be playing on. Every digital label in the exhibition needs to know what work it's related to, and we needed to be able to link those visitor interactions with deeper explorations of our collection's data. To give you a quick demonstration, imagine that I'm in the gallery with my lens. I found something I'm curious about, and I'd like to explore it in more detail later on. I tap the label with my lens like this, and the LEDs light up to let me know that my tap has been registered. The lens reader has now sent a message to the TAPS endpoint on XOS, which records that I've collected this label. That connection can be retrieved later on using XOS's API to provide a jumping off point for exploring more about the work that I was looking at. Using Django as a content management system is a pretty established use case, but using it as a content and configuration management system for a bunch of Internet of Things devices in a physical gallery it was new for us. Fortunately, using the Bellina API has made that relatively painless. It gives us a central way of keeping track of each device's identity and lets us push content to devices from a friendly Django admin. Being able to configure our devices from the web is really handy, but we didn't want to build a gallery that was dependent on perfect network uptime, so our devices cache their content locally. Once our media players and digital labels have downloaded their material, they can continue to operate offline indefinitely. 
One of the other key functions for XOS is to allow us to connect the material we hold in our collection to the experiences people are having in the gallery. This has meant solving some puzzles about what to do with a data set containing records going back over 50 years, with a pretty high rate of variation in how much data and what sort of data is present in each record. Getting a data set with this much variation ready to share with the world has taken a combination of very hard work from our collections team and a system of field fallbacks and overrides that make a best effort at showing the most correct version of the content. As you can see, XOS sits in the middle of a whole lot of really diverse systems in our museum and provides a kind of middleware that allows these systems to talk to each other and share the information they need. It joins together the work of a lot of teams that had previously been separated, and we realised we needed a way to explain it within the organisation. Since XOS has a lot of jobs, or one could say, an arm in a lot of places, we created Socks, our XOS mascot. The name is XOS spelt backwards, and each of Socks's eight tentacles represent a system within the museum that XOS is in communication with. As I mentioned earlier, XOS runs on Azure Cloud. It's a dockerized application running on a Kubernetes cluster and using a Postgres database for storage. Because one of XOS's main jobs is to respond to things happening in a physical gallery space while it has people in it, we wanted to ensure we'd be able to scale up our available resources when there's a lot of activity, that's between 10 a.m. and 5 p.m. most days, and scale back down when the gallery is closed. Kubernetes is a wonderful tool for doing sophisticated things with a cloud-hosted application, but to be honest, at our scale, it does a bit too much and takes a bit too much management to be ideal. We would have preferred to go for a more hands-off way of managing our hosting, and we looked into a few fully managed options like Azure's App Service. What we found was that the specific requirements we had around networking with all those services XOS interacts with couldn't really fit into the pretty cookie-cutter options offered by the managed services. The scaling features didn't cover our use case either. In the end, the advantage of simpler management wasn't enough to make up for the features we'd lose. So Kubernetes it is. In Kubernetes terms, you might be interested to know that we use horizontal pod autoscalers for our key apps and a scalable node pool on the cluster to respond to periods of increased demand. Of course, to know if your scaling works, you need some load on your cluster. Something that 2020 has been remarkably lacking is opportunities to get groups of people together in a gallery to tap on things, so we've automated that part. We've built a few workload models based on the number of people you'd find in the gallery on a busy day, and the number of interactions that could be expected if they were all really excited about tapping on things. We've created testing profiles in JMeter to send that traffic to our cluster. That's given us a chance to observe the system under pressure. We've used those observations to refine the resource requests and limits for our containers. While XOS as it stands today is a relatively monolithic Django app built to the very specific demands of a museum of screen culture, we can see opportunities to peel out particular apps and modules within it that could be useful to other organisations in the cultural sector. We've done a lot of work to build a really functional online system for managing images and videos between our collection, the gallery and the website, and we'd love to see the usefulness of that taken up in other places. We'd also like to make more of our cloud presence, like using Cloud AI to help fill out our collection data, and cloud transcriptions to bring text to our videos. We've done some promising experiments with automated transcriptions. This slide is from a 1960s film about workplace safety, and this sentence has been transcribed by AWS's transcription service with 100% accuracy, no manual corrections required. For film with lower sound quality, the accuracy rate was lower, but still above 50% in almost all cases, which gives us some pretty intriguing opportunities to provide searchable and accessible ways to dig into our video collection. We're at a point now where the bets we made on cloud-based infrastructure a couple of years ago are paying off in giving us some promising directions to explore in the future. Thanks, Ali. As I outlined earlier, we in museums face particular deep technology challenges that perhaps aren't faced anywhere else. On the other hand, if technology can be made to work in a museum, there's a good chance it can work anywhere else. So that's why we've been open sourcing as much of our tech as we can, and you can find our code, data, Bellina, deployable media player, technology standards, and heaps of other stuff over on our GitHub repo. And we write about it on our Acme, Mag on our Acme Labs blog. Now, you're probably wondering when you get to see all of this. Um, and unfortunately, our opening is delayed until uh, a date that is still to be confirmed. But that gives us uh, a bit more time to nurture these open source projects. So. 
if what we're doing sounds interesting or useful to you, then please go and have a look and come and talk to Simon, Ali or me at any time. And if you do find yourself in Melbourne when we reopen, we'd love to see you visit and try out all of this new tech. Um, and thanks for listening to our talk. Uh, we hope to be back next year with an update to tell you how it all went. Thank you so much, folks, for your talk. And um, we will get all of the speakers up here now so that we can uh, answer some questions. Um, so first question that we have here is, um, have you considered a trove-like crowdsourcing project for fixing up low accuracy transcriptions? Much for your talk and yes, we have considered that. Yep, yeah. um, and that is definitely something we'd like to look into in the future. Definitely. Brilliant. Um, God, uh, I think I've been reading these backwards slightly. Um, with your hardware. All of you, uh, how are you planning for long-term repair and replacements? Do you want to take that, Simon? Sure. Um, we've we've got one of each of the devices that we've made on shelves, ready to just be whipped in and out. And then what we're going to do is um, pull them apart, work out which bit is actually broken, and then try and reuse as much as we can. So, yeah. hoping I, it'll go okay. Early on, we were considering all of the. Um, specially designed, um, like Raspberry Pi for video, Raspberry Pi for um, uh, Internet of Things devices. But in the end, we went for plain vanilla Raspberry Pi because they had the highest chance of still being around in some form after um, after several numbers of years. Yeah. Great. Um, and we've got one more question here so far. Um, What's hardware reliability like? I think this one was addressed to Greg specifically. Um, what's hardware reliability like? You might be one of the bigger deployments of Pi hardware in Australia. Yeah, I think we might be. We've got, what, 300s, something like that, boxes full. Um, so far, none of them have broken. Um, oh, wow. We, we're planning. So, so I, I had to go into the office um, last month, um, and we our demo desk was still working. The, the synchronized video had gone out of sync, but everything had just been running 24-7 since February, which is pretty lovely. Um, however, we, do, we don't we do rely on that. We have a tech team who keep who do, do, do regular walks around the exhibition to see that everything's working, the check on the dashboard to, to make sure everything's reporting in. So there are multiple layers of uh, fallback in case something does break and we do expect it to break. It just hasn't yet. Oh, and I just wanted to add one more thing, which is uh, our previous experience with Raspberry Pis is that what breaks is the SD cards. Um, so we went for the SanDisk industrial ones, which you can't find in the shops, but a sort of AV integrator will be able to get hold of. Um, so they're built for m many more power cycles than um, normal. Great, thank you. Um, got another question. I'm curious to know, what does your team make up of developers and engineers look like that help to make this work possible? Yeah, so um, it's it, it's difficult to, to define what the team is because it's so, spread so, so far across the organization. So before I started, Acme had, um, a, an AV team, so they're, they're responsible for, for day to day running of events and exhibitions. And then there's like an exhibition technology team who create a new exhibition and sort of install all of the lighting and the computers and the audio and everything. Um, so, and then we had an IT team who keep all of the back office systems working. And anytime you touch a computer as a member of the public, that's um, the IT team of provision that and kind of hidden the keyboard and locked it all down uh, for us. Um, so, uh, and then we had one developer before I started who was like keeping everything running. And um, it, the, what we realized was one is the worst possible number of developers for a medium. It were better off having zero or more than one. Um, and uh, that's a quote from Ali. <laughs> and um, 
yeah, so we we've we've grew our team to five, I think five or six, depending on how you count it, um, to build the bulk of this stuff and to make sure it lasted for sort of five months of testing, um, and then now as we uh, head towards opening, we're um, streaming, sl slimming back down to sort of operating capacity of, of two developers um, on an ongoing basis. Great. Um, I've not got any other questions coming through. Um, I think I just lost Lee's stream. I think we may have lost Lee's stream there, but I'll just jump in a sec and uh, just say thank you very much for um, uh, your presentation today. And uh, I do have one final question. If people are interested, uh, you know, uh, in uh, finding out more information, is there a site or something they can go in just to see what you're up to? I mean, many of us uh, love Acme. Yeah, um, github.com slash Acme Labs is a good place to start. There's also a really? medium, uh, medium Acme Labs um, uh, site as well where we're posting about our stuff. And um, Benno has just asked what my cat's name is. Um, and this is Stacy. She's probably a bit grumpy to be woken up yet. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> say hi to Stacy. Brilliant. Well, fantastic. And uh, thank you very much for that. Um, I think that's uh, that's basically um, where we'll, uh, we'll leave today. We've got coming up next, of course, our closing keynote from uh, Sean Brady. So that will be happening uh, anytime. Well, it will be happening in uh, 10 minutes. So everyone stick around. But I'd love to just say thank you very much for coming on board. Um, it, we're very proud to have you as Melbourneites, especially. We're all locked down, but it sounds super excited that you're, um, you're still working on some amazing stuff. Real pleasure. It's great to be here. Thanks. Bye. All right, everyone. See you later. Take care.